You know when you find those movies that you just absolutely love, yet when you speak to people about them, yet they don't have a clue what you're talking about? For me, that's The Killing Room. I absolutely love The Killing Room, and I think it is a shame not many people have seen it or even heard about it. So I'm here to right that wrong for you. This is one I found back when I was working in Blockbusters, and it was in the 99 pence rental section. They were like the bargain bucket. 99p, you keep it for a week as well, so you know... It's varying quality in that bucket. Nonetheless, once I found this movie, I was getting everybody to rent it, you know? Might have given it to them for free under the counter. I'm not the reason blockbusters get cancelled, but I might have added to it. On the surface, it does look like quite a standard experiment movie. You know, throw a few people in a room, add a plot to it, and just have them jump through hoops for an hour and a half. Whilst yes, that is correct, I think this movie does a lot right to keep the pace up, keep the intensity going, and keep that air of mystery until the very end. I still remember the first time I seen this movie. It was me and a friend, and the moment this movie ended, which we'll come to, we just turned to each other and screamed. You know that scream where it's not afraid, but it's not quite excitement, it's just in like disbelief and a kind of what the fuck did we just watch moment? Yeah, that was us. So anyway, without further ado, thank you for stopping by and let's get on with The Killing Room. We open up on a message that the MK Ultra project was to be shut down, but without its documents, no one knows for sure if it was shut down. Mystery number one. There's absolutely no messing about in this movie. We get straight into the lovingly named Killing Room. It's showing off its simplistic layout. It's a lot of chrome going on in this movie and like bolted down chairs. It just keeps giving you questions at the start. We are first shown Emily here, getting in some last minute studying before the big day. We hear Dr. Phillips talking and just kind of setting up the movie. You understand, what we deal with here is classified material. I know that voice. It's Peter Stormare, not the biggest actor by any means, but I would argue one of the most recognisable. Hello again. Emily has a history of military psychological experiments and study. We usually don't recruit people over 25. They're too hard to break in. However, this type of work is very new to her. Very new. Like, she's never had anything like this before. They focus on micro-expressions, behaviour, being able to spot lies, that sort of thing. Emily is a massive fan of Dr. Phillips. I base most of my work on your theories and case studies. As I am too. He did not deserve to go out like that in prison break. Still a bit over it. And she's used a lot of his work to cite her research in the past. He gives her this conundrum. You're able to tell if and when somebody's lying to you. Yes, sir. My name is not Mr. Phillips. Is that true or false? just to plant this seed for us two as an audience as to what is real going forward. It's a really effective setup to this movie, like you're hooked fast. Dr. Phillips gives her an assessment just to see if she's suited for the job. I would judge your reactions to a selection of pre-recorded material. Once that's out of the way, he just lays down the ground rules. These tapes do not exist. This room does not exist. Ready. You know, like, comment, subscribe, all that sort of thing. They give the room one final hose down, and it's like military chatter on these radios, just prepping the candidates. Roger that control, we have a claim of crew nearing completion. Control, receiving. Go ahead, receiving. Control, first candidate in route. Roger that, receiving. This sort of chatter is throughout the entire movie. I won't cut to it all the time, but just know when the characters themselves aren't speaking, there's a 90% chance there's this radio chatter in the background kind of setting up what's just happened or what's about to happen. We advise candidate in transit, stand by to initiate phase one. Energy team standing by. It's really fucking engaging because you can kind of just hear it, but you could also go the movie and just ignore it all. Do you know what I mean? 10 hundred hours, initiating phase one, all personnel vacant for incoming candidate. Roger control, we are Oscar Mike. Roger control. We get our first player here, Keddy. Thank you. Sorry. They are given a questionnaire to fill in when they come into the room, and it is not your average questionnaire. Like, you're not just getting the standard ASL on this one, do you know what I mean? And for the record, 30, no, Scotland, if you can't tell already. She is so keen to get into this questionnaire, she goes and breaks her pencil, like, immediately. No! Now we'll never know what her favourite holiday is. I'm not gonna sleep tonight. I broke it. But don't let that weigh on you for too long because in what candidate number two, we've got Tony's entered the game. Give me my date of birth. I'm sorry, it's 
Um, excuse me? Or the room, the killing room. It's not fun here. He seems like your average guy, nothing to stand out, and he just gets on with it. He gets a real stumper for his first question, though. Pretty confusing. Uh -oh. Whilst he's mulling over the answer to that, in walks candidate number three. If you've not guessed, like, we are moving on fast so far. This is Crawford. He's came prepared and we learned that he has a criminal record. ANC, male, DOB, 1965, criminal record affirmative. Code 1202. Roger that, receiving. We have a Naughty boy Crawford. He is going for that any percent speed run in this assessment, like a total nerd. You fucking nerd! with your nerd hair. We learn quick on though that Crawford has done a lot of these experiments. Like it's easy money to him walking in. Sometimes it's just a questionnaire, sit in a room, maybe take a pill. You're like a total pro, huh? Yeah, he is a self-proclaimed lab rat. And finally we have candidate number four. It's only bloody Nick Cannon. Now, I forgot he was in this movie. Like, when I seen the movie, I didn't know who Nick Cannon was. I have since seen who Nick Cannon is, and I forgot that that was him in this movie. Does that ever happen to you? This is him before he started spawning his own football team, though. This is a hood down sort of room, and Paul is looking rough, rugged, and pretty damn shy. Brody P, male. Criminal record, negative. Roger that, regime. Now the gang's all here, we are getting some of the weirdest questions on these questionnaires and just like some of their answers. The answers they give aren't as important to set up the characters, more just to set up the experiment. Do you know what I mean? Crawford here comes in first because fucking of course he did. And he just starts walking around the room, pacing it and helping people out. Yeah, I just want to check each one of these. Cut back to Doc and Emily and she gives her assessment for what's going on since she's watching it back. It's hierarchy and subordination. We simulated the Gottman experiments in grad school. You put a man and a woman, a couple, in a room together, and if one partner acted superior, it was almost always an expression of contempt. She chalks it up to a simple kind of hierarchy experiment. I think you know like the Stanford one where they had equal people with power and not, and how that played out. I think you will find this project a little bit more complex. Yeah, there's more to it than that, I'm afraid, Emily. When was this experiment conducted? Affirmative receiving all candidates. Tony here's looking for the nearest 5G tower to give a call back to his kid, and it is the most mumbled phone call I've ever heard. Listen, baby, um, I'm gonna be late tonight. Uh, they have to drive us back to our cars after this. So, person. Yeah, that kid did not hear your possibly last words. I'm not going to spoil it just yet. Uh, they have to drive us back to our cars after. Crawford breaks down his experience on tests before. What do they usually do? Yeah. He's pretty intense about it, but he is just so proud to be a lab rat. All seriousness is a long time lab rat. Careful about wishing things, you know. You don't want to hope for anything because usually doesn't turn out that way. It's pretty clear from this though that if Crawford has no idea, yet nobody in this room has a clue what they've just signed up for. Dr. Phillips walks in like a bad fart because he is just bringing so much atmosphere with him. Like he hasn't done really anything, but just his presence alone, like you can feel it. Morning everybody, I'm Dr. Phillips. And I'm gonna be the supervisor here today. He gives them a brief rundown of what's going on and just establishes some baselines for them all. We're all American citizens, right? Absolutely. We're all of sound mind. Yeah, most of the time. <laughs> We're not crazy. Good. And he finally gives them a layout of the assessment. Our little experiment here today uh, concerns testing quite extensively the nature and the limitations of the human psyche. The test is subdivided into four separated escalating phases. The first of which began the moment I walked in through that door. Four people brought together in a really weird room, weird assessment. How much are they being paid for this? Listen up, the final payment for the day. A grand? 
Two grand? <laughs> no, no. $250. It's the big leagues, baby. The old 250. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's what you've been framed, Pagey, when you submitted a video of you, like, falling over as a kid. Filling out the form, they go through the standard questions, need some contact information, and our man Paul here, unfortunately, doesn't have any contact numbers to put down. What if you don't have a contact number? You don't have one, leave it blank. Maybe that's why Nick set out in life to just make sure he had as many contacts as possible. Like, you will always get a hold of somebody. The gang all give up their belongings and there's just one last question to ask. How many hours will we be here? Oh, eight. So the groundwork has been set. They are doing a standard nine to five shift. We've got a psychological experiment which has already begun and split into four phases as we progress. What could possibly go wrong? Dr. Phillips is nice enough though to promise them that they are at the very least not going to shit themselves. No, no, I promise. You know what? Want to run into the john every five minutes. <laughs> Good guy. Everybody is now ready and let the games begin. Okay, back to phase one. Well, not games, psychological experiment run by maybe possibly the military. Eh, games. Oh, just before they start, Dr. Phillips forgot one last thing. Uh, by the way, what's your name again? Carrie. Carrie. Fuck me, and just like that, we are down to three. The music here is like some tinnitus just affecting all of us. All echoes, we are closed traffic. We have minimal splatter. Or tinnitus, I know some of you watch me from the States. What? Ma. Excuse me. Ma. Tony here is wondering what kind of state she's in. You know, how bad could a direct headshot really be? How bad? She's yeah, she's definitely dead, mate. Like, she's fucking gone. How bad? Tony is in absolute disbelief about this. Well, none. <laughs> hey, smile, boys. It's fucking shit. It's gonna be all over fucking YouTube. I hope so too, Tony. And on an unrelated note, don't forget to comment and tell your pals. They try the old kick out method with absolutely no luck, and then Tony here has a thought. Maybe this is what this is. The fuck you talking about? The doctor, the experiments, the test, whatever. Yeah. They shoot someone in front of you, and they see how you deal with it. Ah. Yeah, put four people in a room, shoot one of them, and leave the rest of them for them fucking selves. Oh, what, and they're watching up there, taking notes? Yeah. Emily here watching all this play out really just has one question. How are you getting away with this? Really? That was the question you asked? Like, there's so many you could ask at this point. Why did you kill somebody? Was it necessary? Are you okay, man? Why did they do you dirty in Prison Break season two? I'm not over it. Dr. Phillips though just keeps her on track. Like he wants her focus on the experiment. It's important for you to take it all in. Remain calm, never lose control. We get some weird photos here and Dr. Phillips brings up the MK Ultra project being outside of the government. The MK program has always been outside the government. Outside everything. Like it's part of the government, but they want nothing to do with it. Emily was on the fence before. She has no fucking clue what she's signed up for at this point. The MK program? That's not possible. How can you? Are you military? Patriot Act? Dr. Phillips, along with that gruff, husky voice, gives us this sexy look. It is getting steamy up in here. That kill room's gonna be a sauna any minute. Emily, everything will make sense. I fucking hope so too, mate. The guys are trying to work out what's going on. Like, they have no idea where they are because they were transported here or what the experiment is and what they've signed up for. It's not secret. No, it's in a fucking newspaper. It's, it's in the classifieds right here. People knew about this. People are going to go to that, but you know where we are? No. Because everything started looking the same to me after fucking Mansfield. They are clueless and just pulling any threads they can to make sense of this. I've been doing this stuff steadily for a long time, okay? But have you ever been taken from one place to an alternate location? It's not uncommon. They pick you up, they bring you another place, but people don't just disappear. You don't think anyone's gonna know she doesn't come home tonight? The door dings and we hear something is thrown into the room. It, it opened. What was that? It's what they used to kill him. I see. Nick Hand Cannon is now here. Hand Cannon, because it's a Hand Cannon, his name's Cannon. <laughs> Move on. I don't know, you're not in on it. Ridiculous. No, he's not in on it. They are doubting everything, and Paul is getting an itchy trigger finger. Only one of us is going to make it out of here. Four phases, four people. You know what? Phase one is already over, and it's fucking hard. 
Welcome to phase two. Crawford is as cool and calm and collected as you would expect, and he gets in a mag check. Empty. Check the slide. one bullet and there's three of us. He has got one shot, eventually we all calm down and this lovely music starts playing into the room. The How do we up the stakes from here? We throw a timer onto the wall, two hours are ticking on down. You have two hours remaining. The door opens and just throws in yet another question. Please answer question. So the stakes have now been raised in possibly the most simple way you could imagine. What number do Americans choose most frequently between 1 and 33? They all just have to pick a number and furthest away from the right answer is killed. It is really simplistic, but my god is it fucking tense with just that simple question. Refusal to provide answer entirely results in automated end of all remaining subjects. Best luck. We have traded in big set pieces for pieces of paper in this movie, and it is just as tense all the same. Tony kicks off at the grammar though, because f of course. Best luck, it's, it's good luck. Mother, mother buckets! They resort to plan B. Yeah, that one doesn't work either. Loud noises! We get Emily's next observation. Like, we keep checking back in with her to see where she's at. The language following the question purposely stilted. To make the reader think the writer uses English as a second language. Motherfuckers! Came to that conclusion. Well, I had the buggers. <laughs> Good job, I'm impressed. The movie's running a few different angles between the room, these people watching from the booth, but they bring everyone up to speed at the same time. You know like in Mario Kart, if you're in last place, it rubber bands you back to be like kind of in the middle? The movie feels like it's rubber banding its different aspects. That being said, she is acing this death experiment. You go girl. Dr. Phillips opens up a little bit more because it's time to let your guard down. Well, after 9-11, we were out of options, I guess. The movie kind of follows this trend. We get the killing room, and then these two watching it back, going into a little bit of the why. It paces it bloody well. This is the killing room. Ah, she said it. Dr. Phillips gets real and hands down the advice he got from his mentor. Never forget that our enemies have someone just like you. Someone just like me, doing exactly the same thing as we speak. I'm imagining like a psychologically tormented Mr. Miyagi, something like that. Tony is done trying to get out the sides and he starts aiming up. You know, when you can't go through, you've got to climb over, that sort of thing. <laughs> but not before our boys hear something coming through the floor vents. <laughs> Poor, naive Tony is trying to make sense of it. The language is dead. I don't know how to be anything. It's not Muslim. It's not a language. They really let their minds wander here for a bit. We think about it. How can you? I was pretty like a white guy. You don't know who it is. It could be anybody. Listen, you gotta be careful about screwing up your head. That's exactly what they want. It's fair conclusions, but Jesus, do they just jump ahead. Yeah, so why would they want to go after this normal people? Because they want to broadcast this shit. Just like they did with those people when they cut their fucking heads off. They want to play all over the internet. Paul finally pipes up. Well, kind of. Oh. It's this kind of walkie-talkie chatter I was talking about that gives it so much context because we learn through them that all of this has been planted. You know, nothing is an accident in this room. Money like, it's, oh, it's a wall. Kennedy Delta has discovered stimulus one, Charlie. Roger that, Echo. The guys do their worst braille read that you've ever seen. <laughs> before Tony comes up with the big play. It's like a really morbid leaf printing. Did you ever do that? I used to fucking love doing that. They find some really weird messages on the walls here just to fuck with them. Pray. Pray. 
away from us again. Their timer really starts to tick down now. It usually took us six to eight hours to reach this point. But after we put those names on the wall, now that really sped up the process. Thirteen. Tony is trying to think about this question logically. Maybe it's, maybe it's two, maybe one to three, three. Well, Paul, yeah, he just goes glock to the clock. Three. The gun is loose, there's a moment of panic, but Crawford, no, he's staying true to that melee build. I don't want to. Good on you, Crawford. Gotta respect the playthrough. Tony picks up the gun. The door opens, but he can't see somebody to take the shot. He kind of just hesitates for a moment. We regroup and we come up with another plan. Echo 2, amplify transmission. Wilco control. I can't see us up here. I can't keep count. Is this like C or D or E at this point? I don't know. They're somewhere down the alphabet. Go to the window and distract them. I'm going. Go to the window. Tony has to act casual, but he does it in like the most sus way ever before going for the shot. Can you guess what happens next? <laughs> That's right, the door just slams on Tony's arm. But don't worry, Crawford is there to give him some very sage encouragement. You're definitely the most entertaining of all of us are. I'm probably gonna want to keep you around just so they can sit and watch you. Emily needs a minute before she continues with her assessing of this. Is this a problem for you? Not a problem. But let's be honest, that's pretty fair. The walkie-talkies keep on chatting and it is so weirdly positive. Nearing completion of one Delta, waiting for a candidate designation. Mother is present in the control room and all designations are his call. Mother reporting a possible match in this group. Echo Team reports Echoes 1 through 6 active and at their posts and Medical Unit 2 is standing by. Echo Team, how do you read? Lima Charlie Control. Another busy day. Crawford is getting a team going. He wants everyone to be on the same page so they can all come out alive as- Daddy, we're all equal. You need to just follow the rules. One of us got 30 minutes to live. Well, as best as possible. Yeah, now when I first saw the questionnaire, the first thing that came to my mind was 17. Oh, 17, 17 was on the wall. It's gotta be seven. Seven's fine. Seven. Seven and seven. Seven. Perfect, so we all go with the same number, so nobody themselves is the furthest away, and nobody has to die, right? That's how this is gonna go. For real, this is the most tense I have ever been watching a movie for somebody to just simply say a number. Paul is remembering Kerry and he doesn't want to be forgotten either. Kerry Brody, Buffalo. We get a really somber moment of them all saying what is possibly their final words. Just tell her I love her. I Make sure she takes care of my mom. Nobody needs to know. <laughs> Hail Mary, full of grace. That timer finally hits zero and they all have to say their number now. Please submit answer. Like there is no pissing about. Seven. Recognized. Please submit answer. Our boy Nick is playing solo clearly. Crawford has the right response to a grown man saying 17 without context. Fuck. We are told the next casualty is picked. Seven! Thank you. Next casualty selected. And the guys here are now just working overtime to work out who it could possibly be. Like it has to be Paul, right? He's the only one that chose something different. More walkie talkie chat plays and we learn that these three are getting carted away to medical. Control, transporting three statics to medical unit two. Dr. Phillips opens up a little bit more and lets Emily know exactly what really got her picked for this experiment. Most people can't even look into that room. You can. The guys come back and the videos have now caught up with real time. First initiate KR-13 relink and hold short. Echo team prepare for relink and begin online transfers and upload. So Emily was watching playback, however, 
that wasn't like from weeks ago. It was earlier. Like we're talking hours. Fuck me, Dr. Phillips has had a busy morning. I'm too lazy for breakfast most days. He's killed somebody before he's had a second coffee. It is time for her to now get her hands dirty. You worked your whole life at this moment. Up till now, she was watching it from afar. I mean, kind of, it was in the next room, but you know what I mean? Now she is a player in this game. She just takes a minute to observe the whole room and soak in the tension. Dr. Phillips whips out his piece, not like that, and another one is down. There are two remaining, but we don't know which two. They return to observation and Dr. Phillips sets up Emily to get the game going again. On Miss Riley's mark. Standing by. Yes, sir. Commence. Commence re-engagement. So he is handing it kind of off to her to make sure that she's now a player. Our two survivors wake up with what is the most like morning dad noises you've ever heard. We see that Tony is down. Crawford is pissed about this. We all agree to say seven. If only he had the gun right about now. Oh, never mind, they deliver, right on cue. Like, they, these guys really know what you need. This walkie-talkie chatter is amazing. They just show us how calculated it all is. The advised all echoes candidate identified barrier escape route 18. Well, we already have that in the pre-action report. I wonder if that's going to be relevant later. Take notes. We get another question in, but this time it comes with a hint. Clearly not trusting Paul anymore, Crawford rips this off and he is playing solo himself. This has become a kind of free-for-all in the killing room. Where does the United States of America rank on the international list of overall average intelligence quotients? The tables are set. There's no same answers this time. Dr. Phillips ain't having any of that shit. Failed to provide answer entirely when providing the same answer as other subject will result in automated mutual end. Dr. Phillips leaves his card out and Emily spies this happening. Another trap. Did he forget? Who knows at this point? Crawford and Paul though just hash out their last decision. They are really mulling over this last question. I mean it to you. It's an accident. No, you just, uh, you just did what you had to do, right? We get some prayer sounds getting pumped into the room now, like they are really starting to get fucked with. All teams be advised, initiating stimulus one gamma. Well, more than two of them literally being killed in the room, but you know what I mean, like they're up in the fuckery. Crawford is looking to escape, but Paul has very different plans. Is that right above my head? Is it very thin ceiling? We cut back to the observation room and everyone is looking busy. Emily swipes the card. I mean, come on, Emily. This is very clearly a setup. Read the room. Look at the room. Just don't pick it up. Dr. Phillips comes in, none the wiser that Emily's taken the card and lets us know that his job ain't so easy either. If you have to terminate a candidate, you have to do it quickly. As painless as possible. There is also a slight undertone of threat, just for good measure. It's not easy to kill a man. Or a woman. Or that man. We learn that he knew all along who the winning candidate was going to be. You've known her all along. And the questionnaires before you started. To a point. So with that, you have to ask yourself, what is the point of the killing room? You know, he's not whittling down people based on their answers. He is up to something more. First time I watched this movie, not gonna lie to you guys, 
I had not a clue where it was going at this point. If you've not seen it before and you do already, fucking good on you. I was totally blind to it. I was just getting sucked into the moment to moment beats. Anyway, that aside, we cut back to Crawford just practicing his jump shots. So that subtle plan that you were making earlier was to be what? Sneaky or something? Because I mean, there's no point in being sneaky when you're going to be table hopping. <laughs> Polly grabs the gun and helps Crawford dunk. Two people walk in and they are just videoing the two guys, which is almost more unsettling than Dr. Phillips with his gun. Two and four, all short, remain observers only, do not engage. Don't interfere with the experiment. Like, he should now know something is wrong. He's trying to escape, two people are just videoing him passively, they don't add up. Paul charges at them and he is unsuccessful, he must have failed the strength check or something like that. <laughs> Crawford is doing his best John McClane, and Dr. Phillips tells them all to just simply observe it now. Do not interfere with KR-13. He keeps on this escape, the tension is building until eventually he gets gassed out hard. Ah! That suspense is now over. For now. Crawford gets dragged back in and Paul is just watching now. Like he's learned, don't fight back. Emily sees this and she has had enough. She uses that card she swiped earlier to dip and try and save them. Get up! They all get right into action. We now just start seeing the three of them fleeing these white bear halls. Ah, think again. Come on. That's not what happened. That was all in her head. That's what she wants to do but she doesn't have the stones for it. Dr. Phillips calls her out for the key, like he knew all along. Give her the key. All teams standing by for re-engagement. I know this can be overwhelming. Life changing. You have let me down. You can't play this man at his own games. We tried to warn you, Emily. It was obviously a trap. Dr. Phillips just tells her that she is great, but very clearly she cannot handle what is going on inside the killing room. Your analytical skills are exceptional, but you don't have the stomach nor the resolve to be part of our program. She blurts out apoptosis. Apoptosis. Apoptosis, that's your objective, isn't it? Which when I googled it, it's talking about the programmed killing of selective cells in the body, so it does match this movie. So I'm going with that. Apoptosis, that's what it is. That's a new word for me. Paul checks in on Crawford and he's okay. To Crawford, he's just like respawned in the room. They don't have long left for their final test though. Crawford is playing his own games now though, that sneaky Pete that he is. Five. Five. America's definitely in the top five in IQs I read about it in Time magazine. We plan our big final escape. Like it is really heating up in here now. Do you remember the layout of the building? Outside that door there's a hallway. Turn to the right. More than Dr. Phillips' old sexy look. Crawford prepares to like take on walkers at this point. Man just wants to be slippery so they can't grab him, so he lubes himself up in man juice. Not those juices, don't be weird. Is it weird that he now suddenly looks a bit like Mel Gibson, but only when he's covered in blood? Like, I hadn't noticed it until now, and now he's all red, he looks a bit like Mel. He gives some pep talk to Paul while looking the most insane he has at any point until now. Bite. Grab me, do anything you can. You kick, you pull. Headbutt. <laughs> I'm honestly surprised Paul can take him seriously. 99% of it is in your head. If you can beat him there, then you've already won. The docs start breaking down what apoptosis is, and that's definitely for us as the audience. It's a mechanism in the human body where an inferior cell realizes it's detrimental to the system. A cell willing to sacrifice itself for the great good. Are you starting to see some parallels yet? Like, do you know where this is going? Time starts skipping ahead and we get that final beat. Paul has been made to pick first and he has not a clue what to do. Go. So in a moment of desperation, he gets hungry for some metal. I would have never made it. But you will. 
but Crawford is the one that gets shot down. <laughs> Dr. Phillips just rounds up the plan for these experiments in the final words. Program here. Successfully proves that one out of 20 ordinary Americans have the disposition to become a civilian weapon. They're making unalive bombers. That's the nice way of putting it here on YouTube. You know what I mean. A civilian willing to kill themselves for their country. A civilian guarantee to take his own life for our country. Paul has been taken away and Dr. Phillips shows face to congratulate him on passing the experiment. We're proud of you. You're a martyr for your country, Paul. A martyr for your country. Paul is a slippery little snake though and manages to break free. Control, candidate unsecured. Moving west, hallway seven. Roger. Emily has got the chance to save him. Secure all exits. Got, got help. Subject on level three. Got help. Yeah, she doesn't take the chance. She's she's learned her lesson from earlier. The cleaning crew come in and we hear this. Subject is on predetermined course. That shit terrifies me more than something random. You know, just some mastermind being able to control every tiny detail knowing exactly what's going to happen. It's almost like the Stanley Parable as a movie, only it's killing and Dr. Phillips is the narrator. With Emily's 1AA into not helping Paul, she is welcomed into the programme long term. Welcome to the programme. Congratulations, you got the job. On the other hand, Paul breaks into the final room and it looks pretty fucked. And then we get that final message of the movie. Holy hell, everything that we just seen was only phase one. That was the moment me and my friend just turned to each other and started screaming. We lost our minds when that was said in this movie. And to be honest, watching the movie back now, it had the same effect on me. I didn't have anyone to scream to at all, but it fucking hits well. All echoes be advised, initiating phase two, indoctrination. Roger that control, we are standing by for phase two. We roll on to credits and that was The Killing Room. As far as experiment movies can go, I feel like this one managed to toe the line really well with not using a lot of different sets, you know, very much was The Observation Room and The Killing Room. But through such a simplistic movie, you know, you've just got the two rooms, you've got the kind of split timeline thing, I feel they managed to achieve something amazing in this. You know, it was a fantastic thriller, it kept you guessing and you didn't know what was going to happen next. And I'm going to say it one more time, that fucking ending, man, that fucking got me. I really enjoy experiment type movies because the way I see it, when a filmmaker sets out to make one of these, you know, it's likely due to a lower budget because they have to use a confined space. So the writers, the cinematography has to be really creative to engage you throughout and still bring a good movie to the table. Don't get me wrong, that can equally mean that you get some absolute flops as a result of it. But also when you see a good one, it really stands out to me. So with that being said, have you seen The Killing Room before or was this your introduction to it? And I'll ask you guys, what is your favorite experiment type movie? Let me know in the comments. I might find some new suggestions down there. And if you haven't yet, before heading off, please do consider hitting like. It really does help out the channel. It helps push this video out to more people. More people? More people. More people are welcome too. And whilst you're down there, if you can do that, big old favor and hit the subscribe button. It is incredible. I love to see it and I appreciate every one of you that do. But with all that being said, as always, thank you so much for watching. <laughs>